next uh, presentation, which is the presentation of the EU project implement, which we are doing as a partner. ACE is taking part in this project. Peter Optefeld is a project partner. He is the coordinator of the ProfTrack project. He is a senior consultant at Huygen and since 2014 visiting professor at Hasselt University. So That's Peter, right. the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, just before the coffee break, uh, we heard a couple of times, and I think it's very important, uh, about uh, upskilling, about training, CPD, and how important it is uh, in our branch and to come to ends up buildings. So my presentation is actually going about two projects, the ProfTrack project and the Bimplement project, who address uh, training, upskilling, and CPD. And in both uh, projects, uh, Ash, the Council of Europe, is one of our most important uh, partners. So, to start with, uh, a little overview of the current situation. If you look in the European Union, uh, we might expect that we have a slight shortage of uh, building workers by uh, 2020. And um, this is not so much the problem. What the real problem is that uh, there is uh, much more a need for upskilling these uh, workforces. And it is expected that about uh, 3 million uh, workers, both uh, blue-collar workers and white-collar workers, need upskilling by 2020, especially in uh, energy efficiency and technology on ends up building and reconstruction. So one of the challenges uh, of the European uh, Union is uh, not only to come to this upskilling, but also to improve uh, the skills of the European workforce to come to a better quality of NZAPs, especially to reduce the performance gap, both in uh, energy as in other uh, uh, performances. And um, one of the scopes is uh, to upgrade uh, and or setting up large-scale qualification and uh, training schemes. Uh, these training schemes should be cross-trade, cross-level, so this means that we have to have a kind of understanding and transparency between all the trades and the levels that we have. In other words, an architect must understand an engineer and vice versa. But also uh, blue-collar workers should understand the work of white-collar workers and vice versa. All by all, I think that no quality and quality control in construction and re re renovation can be achieved without required skill and trainings. So the European Union has some instruments for that. Uh, for example, the build-up skills, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, uh, uh, programs. Uh, pillar 1 is uh, mainly about national qualification platforms and roadmaps. Pillar 2 already about qualification and training schemes, all on a national level and all only addressing the blue-collar workers. But in the Horizon 2020 uh, program, there was a new call, construction skills. In fact, there were two calls in the EE4 call and the EE14 call, which also address uh, white-collar workers and blue-collar workers, and also on an international scale. Uh, ProfTrack was the very first project that has been uh, contracted in the construction scale call in 2014, and the implement just started uh, this year, by the end of this year, was, I think, the first project that was uh, contracted in the EE14 skills. And in, again, in both projects, uh, Arch the Council of Europe has a key role. So, towards uh, a quality control, because that is really the key issue of uh, coming to upskilling. ProfTrack is, if, if you look at the properties of ProfTrack, it's cross-trade, uh, it's a multidisciplinary approach, but only focusing on white-collar workers. Uh, the main issues that we addressed in ProfTrack were uh, developing methodologies for skills mapping and qualification schemes on one hand, but also to come to a central train the trainers program in Europe, and all these trained trainers could start new uh, national programs. Bimplement builds upon the results and the legacy of ProfTrack. ProfTrack will end uh, in February next year. And again, it's also cross-trade, but it's also cross-level. We look at white and blue color workers. But the most important issue is that we aim for an enhanced quality control, which is enabled by BIM, and we concern consider BIM as a universal information carrier. 
Uh, also, the impl implementation is quite different. We really look on hands-on work, BIM workplaces and learning tools. So, some words about uh, ProfTrack, as this project is almost completed and has uh, many uh, results already available. The main goal was to come to a, a kind of an open education and, uh, platform, uh, a platform where, that we can use for uh, CPD, and it's mainly addressed for professionals in the building sectors. So that can be architects, building managers, engineers, and we do that at a middle and senior uh, professional level. These, uh, uh, this platform will also be used for developing a European qualification scheme to be considered as a part of a lifelong learning process and also for a continuing upskilling of the professionals. Some of the results, I will not mention all, but we have many. Uh, one of the most important things that we did was to come to a methodology of skills mapping so that we could have a good picture of the skills gap of every profession in each country involved. Uh, from there we came to uh, seven national roadmaps where we could uh, build upon to come to uh, national training programs. We also have, a, for example, a build-up skills advisor app to be used by professionals. Uh, a European qualification scheme, I come to that, uh, back to that later. Uh, a database, uh, an educational guide, and uh, last but not least also a trainer trainer program in which we train trainers to start national courses. This is an example of the skills mapping that we have. It's uh, quite simple for each profession and each uh, subject. You can give an indication uh, what the required uh, level of knowledge should be, what the skills should be, and what's actually present. And the difference between these two is the skills gap that you have to address. And from there, you can start to work on training and upskilling. Uh, together with this, we also de uh, developed qualification schemes for each profession, for each phase in the building process on all the issues that we also addressed in the skills mapping methodology. And by using these uh, uh, skills mapping tools and qualifications, we can, for example, uh, come up with these kind of radar diagrams about what kind of uh, competences and skills do you need to have in the architectural branch or, for example, if you are a mechanical engineer. This is all available now and you can find it on our website. Also quite important is that we have an extended database online and in this database all the training material that we could find in Europe from previous European programs is gathered. You can use it to build your own uh, courses. Uh, it's free to use, it has a search engine, it has uh, several options, and you can also now upload, for example, uh, new material if you have so. And for example, if you, uh, once you have been trained in our project, you have uh, the right and the access to upload also your own material. This is a really rich database and you can, you can use it for free. So you can find everything on um, energy efficiency, renewables, and ends up building and reconstruction. So, <coughs> ProfTrack was, again, the basis for Bimplement. And if I look to Bimplement, we had an, a kind of a over, simple overall aim, and it was to achieve an improved quality of ends up construction and renovation by setting up large-scale training programs, CPD, and we do this with BIM-enhanced qualification scheme. So BIM is here a key to achieve this. It's not the overall goal, it's a tool, it's a mean to come to a better quality. And also we address the entire value chain. What's typically in BIMplement is that we consider it cross-trade, but also cross-level. And we try to do that with hands-on and BIM-enhanced workplaces and learning tools. So we have four uh, key objectives. Uh, the improved quality was already mentioned. Uh, it looks very ambitious. As we say, we want to create a new generation of professionals, but at least we would like to work on a basis for that, a new type of professionals and craftsmen that are really deliver high quality ends up projects. 
also very important to foster the interactions between all these different trades and professions. And as in ProfTrack, we also have a repository where we have all the material available. So coming to the approach, in fact, we have uh, to come to a good quality NZAP building or uh, renovation. We have three approaches, three pillars. First of, all, first of all, the qualification methodology that is necessary, a knowledge repository and educational tools, BIM enhanced, and BIM is considered as a medium for this. So to start with the qualification methodology, uh, in fact, we uh, didn't, do not have to start from scratch in the implement because we can build upon the legacy that we have from ProfTrack. But what we do is add the implement uh, taxonomies in order to have a more common language. Then, of course, we have the knowledge repository and the educational tools. And um, this is uh, especially necessary because we have different quality uh, quality needed in different member states. So it's uh, necessary that we also assess the current state and from there we can fill in the developed uh, quality frames uh, with the suitable education materials. And again, we can use many materials from previous projects. And finally, we use BIM as a medium for this. So BIM, in our vision, is not the ultimate goal, but in fact improved quality for ends up construction and renovation. That is the real goal. But the best approach to reach that, to reach these goals, seems for us to be BIM. So BIM is really for us a tool for this. Looking at um, the implementation, a few words about it. Um, the first step that we do is uh, develop the methodology. It's already in progress. From there, we start with local pilot repositories uh, where we have BIM, BIM implement coaches as a kind of awareness manager, awareness campaign manager. We have field labs where the first testing takes place, training of uh, BIM workplace trainers, and from there we go to experimental sites. And in our project, we have uh, more than 50 uh, sites where we try our methodologies. Only in, uh, in, in France alone, we have 50 sites where we can test our methodologies. But we also do it in Spain, the Netherlands, Poland, and in Lithuania. And from there, we try to see if we can really come to be implement in practice. So, in a nutshell, we use BIM as a um, universal information carrier for the quality control. We uh, identify quality control levels. From there, we identify the necessary skills and the involved trained and professional uh, levels that is needed to come to this quality. And uh, from there, we can identify which trainings are necessary and which upskilling is necessary. And this is all BIM enhanced, cross trade cross level, and with this we can enrich BIM models with process or learning metadata. Uh, another issue is that we uh, really use uh, hands-on and BIM enhanced working place, workplaces and learning tools. And we do this, at the, as again mentioned, in at least 50 building sites. The cross-cutting approach is quite important. It's not only cross uh, trade, cross level. It's also cross time, every uh, moment in the building process, but also flexible enough to add, for example, new technologies, innovations, etc., etc. Cost grant country it must be uh, exchangeable uh, with other between countries. Cross value, cross size. We mainly focus on SMEs but uh, we also have a large uh, construction company in our uh, consortium. And we use uh, regional or local experience centers or BIM hubs. Uh, this is a, I think an architect will not like this picture because it's an HVAC system, but what we in fact do, this is a typically BIM uh, picture, uh, what we can do is simply add 
some, 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 some lines, some rules in it about what kind of quality do you need to make these details, what kind of uh, professions do you need, and what kind of training. This is, in fact, what we add to the existing BIM models. So, to come to the conclusions, um, I started with um, uh, a summary of the, the, the task and the challenge that we have in Europe, the, uh, the massive upskilling that is needed. And uh, although the task is uh, massive, uh, 3 million workers need to be upskilled, I do not see, think that the bus and construction skill projects uh, and actions are just a stitch in time. I think that they really contribute to, uh, to this especially uh, what we saw in ProfTrack, the train-the-trainer approach is, uh, is really effective and creates a kind of a snowball effect. What we also notice is that architectural professions are crucial in this when it comes to achieving quality, and I come back to that uh, later uh, in, some, uh, in two pictures. And we think that BIM could enable this and fac facilitate this learning process also in a mutual understanding between all these trades. And last but not least, and I think this is very important, quality control, upskilling, training should also take into account all end-user related aspects because the end-user is finally the, uh, the main stakeholder group who has to benefit of it, especially when we uh, discuss uh, deep renovation. And um, Arsenal Council uh, of Europe is now also involved in a project dealing with deep renovations with the end user uh, in the center. It's the AAA Reno project, which will start uh, within a few months, I hope. So, uh, I've been asked for two or three questions. I don't have questions, but this is what I would like to uh, share with you. And these are some televotings that we had from uh, an event a couple of weeks ago in Bucharest, the, uh, what was it, the um, Vocational Skills for Energy Efficient Buildings. And one of the questions is, uh, which trade or professions have the most influence on the building energy performance and quality? As you see, by far, the architectural branch uh, is considered as the most important one, 53%. That's the good news. This is the bad news. Which trades and professions need the most training for, uh, to achieve this? Again, the architect. Um, from my own practice, I'm an engineer, but I teach uh, in Hasselt to uh, uh, the Faculty of Architecture for ar architectural students, and I try to learn them a little about, bit about building services, but I always start to learn them how important architecture is to avoid all these unnecessary installations. And this is key. I think that there we can do a lot of uh, training. And my belief is that BIM is one of the most powerful tools to come to this quality and to this upskilling. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions from the floor to Peter? Okay, we're going to go on to the next uh, speaker, and then we'll have a, have a small... Um, um, sorry, I just have a small question. Um, Peter, you mentioned energy efficiency and the large impact architects have on it, but uh, is there already like a method to do a full energy model of the building with BIM, for example? Because I know that the heating calculations and cooling calculations are not yet integrated. Uh, this is not a topic that we cover in, uh, in, in BIMplement, but uh, at this moment uh, this is a big discussion and there are some other projects. Uh, for example, I'm also involved in the More Connect project and the Project, project Torna project in which we discuss if it's useful to use BIM to come uh, uh, with a link to energy calculations. Uh, we, have met, uh, we are developing methodology for it. But there's still a discussion going on whether or not it's, it's useful. In my opinion, it's only useful if it's very, very simple and has a real added value. But it's still, we're still working on that. It's not a real <laughs> good answer, I, I, I know, but, it's, uh, but, but at least it's, uh, we are discussing it. 
Thank you. Um, now for something completely different. We've, we've looked at the politics, we've looked at the technical issues, we've looked at the legislative issues, we've looked at the training issues. Now we're going to go to the SME's uh, point of view. Um, Vincent Gogushon is our next speaker from France. He is the founder of Tim Architecture, a uh, studio born in 2011, involved in many different kinds of projects. And when I say SME, I mean SME, because if I understood correctly, when I asked him how many people in his office, and he said, including me, I, I said, no, excluding you, he says one. So <laughs> there are two of them. Uh, and, he, and he's going to tell us how they see BIM, uh, which is probably how we, a lot of us, see BIM, uh, <coughs> especially in, in our part of the world, well, in Southern Europe. Besson. Je peux peut-être commencer sans le, sans le slide. Euh, euh, bonjour tout d'abord. Euh, euh, je représente l'agence Team Architecture, euh, qui est une, une jeune société qui a été créée en, en 2011 euh, et qui est une, une toute petite euh, société, qui est une toute petite euh, entreprise d'architecture, puisque nous ne sommes que deux, deux associés euh, co-gérants de la, de la structure. Et nous sommes installés dans le, dans le nord de la France, dans la région de France. On intervient essentiellement en fait, sur des projets de taille petite, moyenne, essentiellement dans le domaine, dans le domaine public. À 80%, en fait, on, on travaille sur de l'équipement, du logement public, un peu sur du privé. Euh, on utilise la maquette numérique maintenant depuis, euh, depuis 4 ans et euh, on essaye d'améliorer notre démarche euh, BIM, alors à notre échelle en fait, euh, parce qu'on voilà, a une, une petite structure. Euh, on essaye de l'améliorer progressivement en, en, en ajoutant des données euh, dans nos maquettes, en, en améliorant les échanges avec, euh, avec nos différents partenaires. Euh, avec les ingénieurs, avec les entreprises, avec les maîtres d'ouvrage, voilà, tout ça autour de la maquette numérique et en essayant de développer euh, le, le mieux possible en fait, notre, euh, notre démarche BIM. Nous, on s'est euh, on équipé un peu en, en logiciel, on a, une suite, on a la suite Archicad. Euh, voilà, donc, on, a, on utilise la suite, euh, la suite Archicad. Euh, après, enfin, on ne considère pas que nous que ce soit un, un investissement en fait, euh, trop important. C'est plutôt un investissement modéré en fait, par rapport à, 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 tout ce que ça nous, à tout ce que ça nous amène. Là où c'est peut-être plus important, c'est l'investissement euh, en temps qui est nécessaire euh, pour développer, euh, développer ces méthodes. Euh, des temps de formation, on est obligé de se former, on est obligé d'apprendre à utiliser les logiciels et, et c'est ce, cet investissement pour nous qui est, qui est vraiment le, le, le plus important. Voilà. Donc le, le, la présentation, c'est bien une présentation de notre méthode, de notre méthode de travail, pas d'une, pas d'un modèle BIM, mais vraiment de notre méthode de travail qu'on qu adapte, voilà, sur des petits projets à, à une petite, à une petite échelle. Donc on va démarrer tous nos projets en fait par, euh, par la création d'une maquette numérique. Donc euh, dès, le, dès le début des, de la mission de maîtrise d'œuvre, euh, de la candidature quasiment jusqu'à jusqu la, la livraison du bâtiment. Euh, et à l'intérieur de cette mission de maîtrise d'œuvre, euh, on, euh, on va initier la, la, la démarche BIM et puis essayer de la développer le, le, du mieux possible. On s'aperçoit par contre que... Euh, bah, Très fréquemment, avant, avant notre intervention, avant le démarrage de la mission BIM, il y a pas de, il y a, il y a, avant la, le démarrage pardon, de, la, de notre mission de maîtrise d'œuvre, il n'y a, a pas de démarche BIM, c'est-à-dire qu'elle n'est elle jamais, elle est, elle est jamais initiée, en fait, ou très rarement. Euh, c'est-à-dire qu'on récupère, en fait, ne récupère pas de maquettes, en fait, c'est-à-dire qu'il pourrait y avoir, euh, du côté du géomètre, choses comme ça, des maquettes, euh, des maquettes BIM. Ce n'est jamais le cas, pratiquement. Et puis on s'aperçoit aussi qu'après notre mission, euh, lorsqu'on fournit nos DOE et dans la gestion des bâtiments, euh, même avec des maîtrises d'ouvrage euh, d'importance, euh, la, la ville de Lille, la région, choses comme ça, euh, il y a peu en fait, d'utilisation derrière des maquettes numériques. C'est-à-dire que donc, la maquette numérique et la démarche, elle est vraiment cantonnée dans notre mission de maîtrise d'oeuvre. C'est-à-dire qu'avant, il n'y a rien et après, il n'y a, a rien non plus. Euh, je sais pas ce qui passé.
Donc nous, la, la, la maquette numérique, elle va être donc présente tout au long, de, tout au long de, de notre mission. On va extraire de nombreux documents. Tous nos documents vont être, vont être issus de, de la maquette numérique. Euh, on va en priorité d'abord extraire tous les documents 2D, en fait les documents classiques. Donc avec les avantages quand même de la maquette numérique euh, sur, euh, sur la concordance de tous les documents, la multiplicité possible de tous les documents. Euh, on va... passer la slide suivante. Ah, voilà. Euh, on va extraire aussi de la maquette numérique euh, toutes les, euh, tous les visuels 3D, euh, donc qui, sont, qui peuvent être des visuels de travail, mais qui peuvent être euh, alors des visuels filaires, des visuels, des visuels techniques, euh, tout, tout ce genre de, de documents, et qui sont aussi des visuels euh, de, de communication sur le projet, euh, pour la maîtrise d'ouvrage, pour les entreprises, pour, euh, pour, tout, pour, pour, nos, pour nos partenaires. Euh, on extrait, et de plus en plus, au démarrage de notre utilisation de la maquette numérique, on ne l'utilisait pas trop. Maintenant, on essaye de, de mettre le maximum d'informations et le plus d'informations possible dans nos maquettes pour renseigner tous les objets, tous les éléments, et à partir de là, en fait, extraire de la documentation de, la document, de, la documentation de projet de la maquette numérique, donc ce qui nous permet de faire des tableaux de nomenclature, de menus extérieurs, de menus intérieurs, de listes de matériaux, et donc il y a, il y a une facilité après de, de synthèse du projet pour tous, les, pour tous les intervenants autour du projet qui est, qui est, qui est facilité. Pour exemple, voilà un tableau de nomenclature de menuiserie extérieure, euh, alors très synthétique, mais euh, tout, est, enfin, on, tout est paramétrable euh, enfin, suivant le projet. Et euh, on, peut faire les, enfin, on peut lister les coûts, les prix d'achat, les performances thermiques. Euh, voilà. Donc c'est des documents assez synthétiques et euh, qui, nous, qui, nous, qui nous aident pas mal dans la conception. Euh, de la maquette numérique, on va extraire euh, également les modèles 3D communicants, donc avec euh, euh, à partir d'hypermodèles qu'on va qu'on qu va visualiser sur des viewers gratuits, des choses comme ça, sur Bimix en particulier. Euh, alors ça a plusieurs avantages pour nous. Pour nous, dans le travail, ça permet une visualisation rapide du projet euh, et une vérification en fait rapide des éléments du projet grâce à la navigation fluide et tout, tout ces, euh, tout, tout, toutes les caractéristiques de la, du logiciel. Et ça permet aussi euh, à, la, à la maîtrise d'ouvrage d'intégrer de, de, rapidement les éléments, les éléments du projet. Euh, un des derniers documents qu'on extrait de la maquette numérique, hein, c'est les modèles 3D d'échange, qui sont là pour le coup des modèles de travail avec, euh, bah, les, encore une fois, nos partenaires, les ingénieurs, euh, les entreprises. Donc, à notre niveau, sur les projets pour lesquels on travaille, l'ensemble de nos partenaires n'ont pas les mêmes compétences, donc c'est-à-dire qu'on va s'adapter en fait, les échanges vont être adaptés à chaque fois, enfin on le verra par la suite, mais on adapte nos, on adapte nos échanges, et voilà, ces modèles d'échange et de travail sur la maquette numérique sont aujourd'hui sur nos projets efficaces avec certains corps d'État, les charpentiers, les, les chauffagistes, des choses comme ça, les ingénieurs thermiques, avec d'autres corps d'État, c'est encore un peu compliqué en fait, sur, des, sur des petits projets. Pour synthétiser un petit peu sur l'apport la, sur la, en fait de, la, de la démarche pour nous, on a une conception globale du projet euh, qui, qui nous permet d'être plus productif, mais qui augmente pour nous la qualité en fait des bâtiments qu'on va produire parce qu'on a une, une, une vision en fait du, du projet plus, plus rapide, plus, enfin une vision d'ensemble du projet euh, de manière très précoce en fait dans les études et ça permet de travailler rapidement en fait sur les euh, sur l'ensemble du projet. On peut valider de manière précoce l'ensemble des choix qu'on va, qu va faire. Euh, la maquette numérique, elle nous permet euh, également de faire des détections de clash alors que j'ai nommé moi, artisan, une détection artisanale de clash euh, sans forcément utiliser de logiciels dédiés en fait, euh, type Solibri. Ou, euh, mais euh, simplement, en fait, l'utilisation de la maquette numérique permet euh, visuellement de contrôler en fait, des superpositions, des, mauvaises, des collisions entre objets. Et, voilà. Donc on a, on, a, on a cette facilité en fait, euh, avec, euh, avec l'usage de la maquette numérique. 
la communication du projet, on en a parlé un peu, c'est euh, voilà, un, un des grands atouts de la, de, la, de la maquette numérique. Et puis un dernier point qui nous, 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 nous est important, c'est le, le géopositionnement des projets, du projet, euh, en intégrant directement les caractéristiques, euh, enfin dans les maquettes, les caractéristiques, les, les caractéristiques des sites. Euh, voilà, on est capable très rapidement euh, d'aller euh, échanger en fait, avec, les, avec les bureaux d'études thermiques. Euh, sur des, avec, des maquettes, euh, avec des maquettes numériques euh, et réaliser en fait à partir de ces, de ces maquettes les études solaires, les études thermiques, euh, toutes les études d'éclairement et réellement en fait de, 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 de gérer le projet euh, très en, enfin de, de caractériser le projet très en amont en fait hein, grâce à ces outils. Voilà. Euh, pour illustrer un petit peu ce, cette, cette démarche et les outils, ces outils qu'on utilise, euh, j'ai choisi d'illustrer le, le propos par un, un projet qu'on a, qu a réalisé pour la région Hauts-de-France. Euh, on va aller rapidement sur la présentation du projet. C'est un projet euh, donc pour, pour, le, pour la région Hauts-de-France euh, à Asbrook pour un lycée, une requalification complète de la demi-pension. Euh, donc c'est un projet de moyen enfin de, 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 avec un coût de travaux de 2,5 millions euh, et puis 1500 mètres carrés de, 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 de surface euh, concernée par des travaux avec de la réhabilitation, avec de l'extension. Sur ce projet, en fait, il n'y avait, avait pas de démarche BIM spécifique qui avait été demandée par la maîtrise d'ouvrage. Et ça, c'est quasiment le cas euh, tout le temps, en fait, dans nos projets, sur les projets sur lesquels on, on, on travaille. Il n'y a pas de démarche BIM qui est demandée, en fait. Ça veut dire qu'à aucun moment, les maîtrises d'ouvrage euh, imposent des compétences BIM euh, aux entreprises, aux, aux maîtres d'œuvre et aux intervenants autour du projet. C'est très rare, enfin voilà, sur, depuis quelques années, euh, il y a eu un projet, un concours sur lequel on, a eu, on avait une, une demande BIM. Euh, sinon, cette démarche, c'est est nous qui, qui l'initions en fait. Donc euh, c'est-à-dire qu'on se retrouve sur, sur nos projets avec des partenaires qui ne sont pas forcément qualifiés en fait. Qui sont, qui, qui, donc on a une nécessité d'adapter notre, notre mode de travail et la manière dont on échange avec, euh, avec les entreprises et les, et les partenaires. Euh, donc le projet, euh, le, le, le projet euh, de, de la demi-pension des Flandres. Donc c'est un gros restaurant scolaire avec une cuisine de pré... ah, oui, un gros restaurant scolaire avec une cuisine de préparation, des salles de restaurant. Euh, le programme donc c'était la restructuration complète de l'équipement avec des extensions, des salles de restauration, des, euh, des halls d'entrée, des halls de, de la distribution de l'ensemble du bâtiment. Euh, c'est un, un, un bâtiment des années 70 euh, avec une structure pot-au-poutre assez, assez classique. Euh, au, démarrage, enfin, au démarrage des études, on a, la première étape en fait, pour nous de, au démarrage des études a été de définir les objectifs du projet, les grandes lignes du projet, en fait, euh, les, les caractéristiques du, du projet de réhabilitation. Et à partir de ces caractéristiques, on a défini en fait, euh, un, un niveau de modélisation de l'état existant du bâtiment. C'est-à-dire qu'on a, euh, a travaillé sur une modélisation générale sommaire de l'existant, euh, avec en portant une attention particulière sur euh, la modélisation structurelle, sur euh, la modélisation des abords, des environnants, parce que c'était des caractéristiques du projet qui étaient importantes pour nous, en fait. Euh, le, le bâtiment est en hauteur. Euh, on savait qu'on allait avoir une, une intervention sur la structure du bâtiment assez, euh, assez fine. Donc la modélisation, elle c'est de l'existant. La modélisation de l'existant, c'est euh, concentré sur certains points en fait, du, du, du bâtiment. Une fois qu'on a eu modélisé euh, l'état existant, on transfère le, le, le modèle euh, à nos différents partenaires. Donc pareil, suivant leur, euh, leur capacité à, à exploiter les maquettes numériques, ben, on utilise euh, tel, ou tel, euh, tel ou tel fichier, tel ou tel format. Euh, Dès le début du projet, au démarrage du projet, donc une fois que la modélisation est réalisée, on, on, on teste les premières approches, nos premières approches du projet, et on, on fait une, une validation des premiers choix euh, par la maquette numérique en testant euh, les, premières, euh, les premières intentions de projet. Euh, sur ce projet, en fait, on avait la maîtrise d'ouvrage qui souhaitait euh, installer euh, des, un, un bâtiment modulaire préfabriqué en extension du, du bâtiment. Et on a jugé nous, très vite que ce, cette solution n'était pas bonne et qu'on préférait privilégier une, un, un bâtiment en ossature bois euh, spécifique, adapté, euh, adapté au projet. Et ça, en fait, on a réussi en fait, à, à, à orienter les choix de la maîtrise d'ouvrage 
je vais dire très facilement euh, grâce, un peu, grâce à la maquette numérique parce qu'on a réussi en fait, à communiquer euh, sur euh, les éléments euh, sur l'état existant du projet sur, no sur, euh, sur l'état projeté et euh, très facilement en fait, on a réussi à, à, à faire évoluer les, le, les, les choix de la maîtrise d'ouvrage euh, ensuite dans les études on, enfin, on, on continue à définir le, le, le projet et on, on précise en fait le, le, la définition du projet en travaillant sur les prises de lumière naturelle sur, sur les éléments sur les matériaux sur toutes les, toutes les caractéristiques techniques et, et architecturales du projet nous on dispose de, de MEP Modeler on s'est équipé de MEP, de MEP Modeler qui n'est pas une, un logiciel très cher en fait mais qui nous permet euh, très rapidement euh, de valider des caractéristiques dimensionnelles en fait de, de, de réseaux euh, de ventilation tout ça qui sont souvent des qui ont souvent des caractéristiques dimensionnelles contraignantes en fait dans les euh, dans, dans les bâtiments et donc cette utilisation nous de Map Modeler nous permet d'anticiper en fait pas mal de pas mal de contraintes euh, et de et de collision de d'objets de, 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 en fait euh, la maquette, elle nous, elle nous permet par exemple aussi euh, euh, de contrôler, euh, de contrôler, de, de contrôler l'ensoleillement dans les salles de restauration. On avait fait le choix d'avoir un grand mur rideau en fait euh, qui était orienté sud-ouest. Donc euh, très facilement, en fait, on a pu, donc grâce à la géolocalisation du projet et puis aux simulations d'ensoleillement, on a pu contrôler en fait l'ensoleillement les, 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 des salles, des, des salles qu'on projetait. L'étape suivante en fait, dans la définition du projet, euh, c'est sur la définition des détails et des ambiances euh, de projet. Donc là, toujours, toujours grâce à la maquette numérique, euh, on est assez proche de, 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 de la réalité sur les études d'éclair, sur les études d'éclairement, sur les, sur les matériaux, sur les choses comme ça. C'est euh, assez facile de communiquer en fait, sur un projet euh, avec des visuels en fait, euh, de, de ce type-là. La gestion du détail, euh, et grandement facilité aussi euh, avec la avec l'usage de la maquette numérique euh, et c'est pas simplement en fait la représentation du projet c'est aussi la, la qualité pour moi du projet qui, qui est en jeu parce que très rapidement en fait on arrive à, à avoir un niveau de détail euh, qui va être assez poussé et qui va permettre de donner une qualité importante euh, au, au projet euh, sur la dernière partie sur la dernière partie des études euh, on va euh, on va travailler en fait sur des, des visuels qui vont être plus plus communicants en fait et qui vont permettre aux entreprises de de, 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 de chiffrer leurs propositions. Euh, donc c'est pareil, enfin avec euh, avec euh, l'outil euh, maquette numérique, on arrive à, à avoir des choses assez didactiques euh, et qui sont qui permettent une communication du projet euh, assez euh, assez facile, une optimisation également du du phasage de l'opération. Euh, et une lecture claire en fait de tous les paramètres de tous les, tous les paramètres du projet. Voilà, on arrive à avoir des schémas de, de ce type-là facilement en fait, sans trop, enfin, à partir d'une maquette relativement bien construite, euh, on arrive à avoir des, des visuels très très communicants en fait, hein, qui permettent un chiffrage précis en fait euh, de, de l'offre et une plus grande fiabilité après derrière sur le sur le sur le chantier. Euh, sur la conduite de chantier, justement, en fait, sur ce projet, donc comme je le disais tout à l'heure, il n'y avait pas de démarche euh, spécifique euh, demandée par la maîtrise d'ouvrage et de, pas de démarche BIM. Donc, en fait, on s'est retrouvé euh, à travailler avec des entreprises qui, qui n'avaient pas forcément les compétences euh, pour, pour échanger en, fait, euh, en BIM euh, autour du projet. Donc la première chose en fait euh, qu'on qu a réalisée sur le sur le démarrage du chantier, c'est de faire un état des lieux, de faire une synthèse dans le mois de préparation, euh, au cas par cas avec chaque entreprise et de, de définir en fait les, les méthodes d'échange qu'on allait avoir avec chacune des entreprises en fait. Donc il euh, y a plusieurs cas euh, qui ont été euh, on a eu on a eu plusieurs cas. Le meilleur le cas numéro un avec plusieurs entreprises comme l'entreprise de charpente d'ossature, euh, l'entreprise de chauffage ou de ventilation avec lesquelles on a eu on a pu avoir des échanges de, 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 de modèles 3D. Donc en fait on a on a donné des maquettes IFC. On a, euh, elles ont travaillé leur, euh, leur plan d'exécution, enfin leur document d'exécution en 3D et qu'on qu a réintégré dans notre maquette numérique. Euh, D'autres cas, par exemple le, le, le cas de, du gros œuvre ou du, ou du VRD, 
c'est des cas particuliers, c'est des, des entreprises qui ne, qui ne travaillaient pas en 3D, euh, mais c'est des éléments qui nous semblaient nécessaires euh, à intégrer dans la maquette numérique euh, dès la fin du mois de préparation, qu'on ait l'ensemble de leurs documents d'exécution en 3D dans la, dans la maquette numérique. Donc euh, c'est nous qui avons fait le travail, on va dire que c'est la, la modélisation des éléments en fait, du, du, du gros œuvre et du VRD. Euh, c'est la maîtrise d'œuvre qui a remodélisé ces éléments et les a intégrés dans la maquette, euh, dans la maquette numérique. Euh, d'autres cas, euh, après c'est des cas particuliers pour chaque entreprise, mais euh, d'autres cas comme l'électricien par exemple, pareil pas d'échange 3D avec l'électricien, pas de remodélisation de ces éléments, mais, des, euh, mais des, euh, une, une intégration en fait en 2D euh, des informations de, de ce corps d'état dans la maquette. Donc au final, tout, toutes les, à la fin du mois de préparation, toutes les informations, toutes les entreprises, tous les documents d'exécution euh, sont intégrés dans la maquette, euh, sont intégrés dans la maquette numérique. Euh, pas de n'importe quelle façon, ça veut dire que sur certains cas, euh, le travail est vraiment partenarial, sur d'autres, euh, c'est nous qui allons chercher l'information, qui remodélisons et qui, euh, et qui, et qui intégrons dans, le, dans, le, dans la maquette. Euh, L'illustration, par exemple, du travail qu'il y a eu sur ce projet avec le, avec le charpentier. Donc, on a, euh, on a travaillé, euh, enfin, l'entreprise le, le, a travaillé à partir de notre maquette euh, DCE. À partir de cette maquette, elle a réalisé ses, ses documents d'exécution où elle a, euh, par rapport à notre maquette, par rapport à notre maquette euh, dimensionner précisément tous ces ouvrages euh, elle a intégré tous ces éléments techniques les éléments euh, de ferrure, les platines euh, les sabots, enfin tous ces éléments techniques qui n'étaient pas nous intégrés à notre, à notre maquette DCE mais qui sont utiles dans la maquette euh, dans la maquette d'exé et puis elle a renseigné également ces, ces objets c'est à dire que tous les, tous les objets qui sont sur cette maquette sont renseignés, sont identifiés par le charpentier, par l'entreprise, et euh, chaque objet en fait est identifié comme une panne, comme un arbalétrier, et nommé en fait euh, comme un comme, comme il l'est dans la réalité. À partir de, à partir de, de cette maquette, euh, on la vérifie, on vérifie, nous, notre travail pendant le mois de préparation, on vérifie la conformité de cette maquette avec, euh, avec la maquette euh, architecte euh, et on valide les, les, les éventuels éléments techniques qui auraient pu être ajoutés ou modifiés par l'entreprise. Le, euh, on va y ajouter... Euh, on va y ajouter les éléments modélisés euh, des, gros, des, des autres corps d'État, du gros œuvre, du, du, du VRD, euh, qui nous permet de vérifier euh, les implantations, les réservations dans le gros œuvre, dans les, dans les éléments bois, euh, de vérifier les liaisons avec les, euh, les dalles, les escaliers, tous les éléments en fait, euh, de coordination euh, entre, entre corps d'État. Euh, les superpositions avec le site, euh, avec les murs rideaux, avec le calpinage pour définir, enfin, sur la définition précise du, du calpinage du mur rideau. Voilà. Une fois que tous ces éléments en fait, sont vérifiés et que les échanges ont eu lieu avec l'entreprise le, avec qui a remodifié son modèle, euh, on réintègre son, son modèle dans notre maquette globale et euh, on peut travailler sur la deuxième phase, on peut travailler avec les, 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 le second œuvre et travailler plus, plus finement en fait, sur, le, sur, sur le, le, les éléments euh, du projet, le second œuvre et les lots techniques. Euh, donc avec l'agrégation des modèles en fait, entreprises et des modèles architectes. Euh, donc à partir de là, on peut travailler euh, comme on a les vrais éléments du charpentier avec les vrais éléments euh, de ferrure, de contreventement, tous les éléments en fait, qui peuvent avoir une incidence en fait, sur le calpinage des plafonds, sur le calpinage de l'éclairage, enfin, sur tous ces éléments-là. Euh, le, le fait de les avoir euh, très en amont dans le chantier, euh, quasiment sur la fin du mois de préparation, on a une maquette... Euh, très précise du, du, du projet, ça permet d'avoir euh, ra rapidement une définition euh, assez performante en fait, et efficace du, du projet, sans surprise, sans surprise par la suite. Voilà. Donc le réglage, euh, l'exemple par ici, par exemple ici, l'exemple de l'âme de Brissoleil sous un, sous un préau euh, qu'on a pu caler très très vite en, fait, en altimétrie, euh, qui n'ont pas interféré avec, euh, avec le contreventement du préau. Voilà, c'est des petits détails, mais c'est des choses en fait, dans la globalité du projet qui peuvent avoir un impact, et, euh, ouais, un impact important sur la, sur la qualité du du projet. Donc on se retrouve au final on, à quasiment à la fin du mois de préparation avec une maquette euh, numérique qui va être au plus proche du projet, euh, du projet, du projet construit. 
on essaye dans le chantier euh, de travailler de plus en plus maintenant avec, euh, d'amener la maquette numérique dans le chantier. C'est-à-dire qu'on va essayer de travailler euh, avec, euh, notamment avec Bimix, euh, qui est pour nous très facile d'utilisation. Euh, on peut exporter les modèles, euh, les modèles 3D, euh, l'ensemble de la documentation euh, 2D, les plans, les coupes, toute la documentation 2D du projet peut être euh, lu sur un, sur un smartphone avec, euh, très peu, avec une navigation très fluide et c'est vraiment très efficace. Et ce genre d'outil, en fait, on essaye réellement de l'utiliser maintenant euh, pendant le chantier et les conducteurs de travaux, les conducteurs d'opérations, euh, les compagnons sur le chantier, euh, de plus en plus, sur leur, smart, sur leur smartphone, ont en fait la globalité de, de, du projet, la maquette numérique et peuvent naviguer dans l'ensemble du projet euh, et euh, ont accès à toutes les informations du projet. En fait. Donc c'est un gain important sur la, sur, enfin c'est une optimisation vraiment du temps, enfin, du temps de, du temps de travail et puis une, des sources d'erreurs en fait qui sont, qui sont, qui sont enlevées. Voilà donc quelques vues du, de, du, du projet, euh, du projet réalisé. Euh, une fois l'ouvrage réalisé, on fournit à la maîtrise d'ouvrage euh, nos DOE, on fournit la maquette numérique au format, au format natif, au format, au format HICAD, et également on la fournit au format IFC. Alors, ce que je disais tout à l'heure dans la première partie, c'est c'est rarement en fait exploité, c'est des données. On s'aperçoit que les, les documents DOE sont, sont utilisés, enfin, les, les, les plans, les documents classiques en fait, DOE sont utilisés. Par, par les maîtres d'ouvrage dans la gestion du bâtiment. Par contre, les maquettes numériques sont aujourd'hui pas du tout utilisées, enfin à l'échelle de nos projets en tous les cas, sur des, des projets de moyens. Euh, les, maquettes, les maquettes sont archivées et ne sont pas du tout euh, utilisées. On n'a pas d'exemple, en fait, nous, de, de, de livrables qui ont, été, euh, qui ont été exploités. En synthèse, euh, voilà, simplement euh, terminer sur le fait qu'il y a un gain pour nous de productivité qui est, euh, qui est, vraiment, euh, qui est vraiment important. Plus que, de la, plus que de la productivité, c'est la qualité, je pense, du, du projet, euh, avec un, un niveau de détail qui est poussé plus, plus rapidement, euh, avec une répartition différente des temps de, des temps de travail sur, le, sur, la, sur la, les temps d'études, où on a un travail plus important en, fait, en début d'étude et euh, qui, se, qui devient beaucoup plus efficace sur la fin, sur la fin des études. Euh, une démarche BIM qui est pour nous beaucoup plus efficace aussi si elle est initiée par la maîtrise d'ouvrage et que tous les partenaires sont concernés. À notre échelle, c'est très rare. Voilà. Il y a la ville de Lille qui commence en fait à, à, à demander et à faire, même sur des projets de 1 million d'euros de travaux, à demander en fait des, équipes BIM, des équipes BIM et des entreprises BIM. Donc là, c'est effectivement euh, la qualité des échanges est plus, est plus importante. Euh, voilà. Après, je terminerai simplement en disant que nous, l'intérêt, en fait, enfin, le, 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 à notre échelle, euh, pour que la démarche fonctionne, il faut qu'elle soit souple, en fait, et qu'elle soit, euh, qu soit flexible. Euh, et euh, réellement, en fait, aujourd'hui, sur nos projets, c'est à, à, à nous vraiment de nous adapter et d'adapter notre, notre, nos outils et notre mode de travail aux, aux différents interlocuteurs qu'on qu a sur les projets. Voilà. few questions we thought we'd intersperse again with the little voting machines mostly to wake you up a bit um, bear with us so our public authority is taking enough steps to support the implementation of BIM Next. Are there any questions from the floor to Vincent? So I would like to ask my question I just thought to you just before. More and more clients, if public or private clients, are asking to get a model in a defined uh, software version. 
in a defined uh, or plan, Revit or uh, Archicad, even in a specific uh, uh, annual version to deliver the final model. And that's the opposite of what we are just talking about, to get an open BIM. I would like to get some uh, exchange from the floor here, if that is in a general purpose all <coughs> around Europe, or if we, are, if we, if we can uh, tell our clients that we are working in an open BIM model, and then the final uh, model will be delivered as IFC only, or if we are just uh, being blocked by our clients now to have an office, two or three different versions of softwares, or eventually, if we are, if the access to the market is closed to only those architects or engineers having a specific license and a specific soft software. Any other? Well, this is a specific experience. I don't know if anybody else has had this, where the client is actually asking for a specific product rather than accepting your one. I don't know how this can be. Yeah. Um, well, in Norway, we can say that we don't experience <coughs> this. Uh, we, uh, or the clients here, are based on open BIM, but they don't require a specific uh, software. Say something about the Netherlands, maybe? Yes? Maybe I can ask something about, yes. In the Netherlands, basically, the, the public um, clients support open bid. And um, I think, in my case, what we heard a lot from our architecture firms is that um, it's usually that the client itself doesn't really know what he's actually asking for. So he's, he's asking for what is generally whispered in his ear by other clients who have a, um, have a use of Revit or, or other uh, things. So if you talk to the client about what he actually needs the data for, then um, suddenly OpenBIM comes available. So um, uh, our experience is that it is usually a sign that the client doesn't really know what he's asking for. I would like to ask a question. Uh, to people who have had more experience in BIM, how how much is BIM used in actual uh, user occupancy feedback or building management post I mean, after the building is finished? Is, is this a client? Is this something the client is looking for? Is it something that is being developed, or is it something already quite normal? I mean, how you know apart from BIM for designing, I mean, I'm talking about BIM for management of the building. I think China, that's the main point in Luxembourg. Our public clients now are asking for a Revit model, for instance, because they are using a facility management tool using Revit. In that case, we are obliged to produce a final model in Revit, even if our, in our office we are working with different software. And that's a, a point we, for the moment, can't know how to, find, to fight against this point. That sounds difficult, and even if one major in my, my, one major ex, um, competitions, they ask for the moment to to be to be uh, admitted to give an, uh, to give a final model in a specific specified uh, software. So I think so the, the area is restricted to give next to give an access to all these uh, competitions. Okay. I could also elaborate a little bit on that because um, I I hear what you say, and that's also the the that's also the status in in uh, in, in Denmark that this is an issue, and we often see it now as it's coming in in, in contract that the the client they want our Revit models uh, delivered at any time in the project, it's not even at handover, and I mean I already had pretty bad experiences where we're being kicked off a project, delivering our whole knowledge in a database with, uh, with hundreds of, of objects that we spent approximately 100 euro a piece on creating, and uh, that we are supposed to hand over for free. That's, that, that's kind of, uh, and yeah, 
it's it's a difficult situation. Um, I'm going to move on to the last speaker, and then if we have time for questions at the end, I think uh, this kind of debate could go on. Uh, Astrid van Fier, van Fien, um, Snohetta. She's a senior architect in Snohetta, which does not need any presentation, offices in Oslo and in New York. Um, and she will be giving the final lecture, which we're all very pleased to hear. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? I think uh, you probably are thinking the same thing as I do. I'm more into this ch -ch -ch tap beer. I have this uh, gorgeous app here. It tells me in 30 minutes my beer is cold. That means that I have only 30 minutes to speak. So we will see how it goes. I start it now, okay? Or 35, then the beer really is cold. You have 35. Oh, gorgeous. Okay. Snöta. Snöta is the highest mountain in the Dovre mountain plateau. Um, at Dovre, we have the mountain king. His name is Dovre Gubben. He's a troll. And our first office was above Dovre Gubben's hallway. It was on the top floor. And that's where our name comes from. People, we are Snuhetta. We create architecture, landscapes, interiors, and brand design. Human interactions shape the space we design and how we operate. 200 employees around the world, around 40 different nations, 50% women, 50% men. We are an international office based in Oslo, based on Scandinavian values. This is a picture of our head office. At the, it's a warehouse in the harbor of Oslo. And this is a picture from our office space. It's Monday meeting, and we're all sitting there in the amphitheater. Since 2001, I have been a Snöhetta. My name is Astrid. I was born in California by a Norwegian mother and a Dutch father. I was raised on the coastal island of Stord on the west coast of Norway. As a project leader, I've been leading several competitions, winning competitions and projects. Among them, King Abadullah Sis Culture and Learning Center, 100,000 square meters of culture in Dagan, Saudi Arabia. And the other, which I'm gonna speak about today, is KMD the Art and Design Center in Bergen, now named Fine Art Music and Design Center, KMD. This is a picture of KMD. It's a pioneering work in the construction industry, in lean design, BIM, and construction management. And if you see KIB, in some of the illustrations, that is because this project has been ongoing since 2005 and just changed name. Does this seem familiar? I've been through quite a few projects having that feeling. Everybody is running, nobody looks aside. We have different tools, nobody is interacting, acting. Design processes, they are complex and they are iterative. With new tools like BIM, there are almost no limitations anywhere when it comes to the amount of information. I will use this opportunity to talk about how we, through one single project, have created this new mindset of how to manage 
the enormous information flow. I will share some methods we have established enabling the design team to slice up the pile of information into manageable pieces. The outcome is steady and constant workflows delivering information into the BIM model, workflows that are, and this is important, workflows that are conclusive and irreversible. This is a ceiling plan. That's where all fields meet. We know it. It's some of the most complex items we have. And especially in an art and design school with over 200 systems, a lot of machineries that needs to interact. There are, of course, many challenges to overcome during design. Today, I will focus on some of them. First of all, I've already mentioned it, it's the information flow. No limits and new tools. So then the question is, how to manage the amount of information? How to enable us to chop up into manageable work packages? How to create steady and constant workflows that deliver products that are conclusive and irreversible? In the KMD project, our focus has been we want to optimize the input from the specialists. Highly competent engineering and design team in a high cost country. We want to make sure that we get the right product at the right time. Let's start with a small film. Do I press the screen? This is our wooden block floor in the KMD project. 140,000 blocks, 70 by 140 millimeters. It takes a lot of effort. You need to know your trade. You need to know what comes first and what comes last. You also need to interact with others. For example, this hall has a ceiling height of 23 meters. Nobody can work above you when you are kneeling. This is our BIM model. The wooden block floor has 140,000 pieces. Our cross-disciplinary model for Snöhetta for the engineering fields of electro and ventilation had altogether 100,000 items. A complex model to puzzle together. And we will talk more about how we decided to go ahead. In the KMD project, firstly, we demanded all participants to work in the same tool, a Revit model. Secondly, we demanded all participants to have the same goal. We were all focusing in on the same effort to fill in the BIM model, and I say this now for the third time in this lecture, with cross-disciplinary and quality-checked information. It sounds easy. Our main objectives were, A, 
in the design phase. We wanted to create flow efficiency instead of resource efficiency. And why? The more you're able to control before you start construction, the better. Investment through in thorough and cross-disciplinary quality check design pays off on the construction site. Secondly, in the construction phase, we wanted to create flow efficiency once again, plus execution control. And why? Execution control means to be prepared and to know what comes when. Mistakes in construction cost us all losses, poor quality and rework. So this is our BIM model. We're gonna start and we're gonna deliver. This lecture will focus on design phase in KMD, and only that. And we have already talked about all participants having the same goal, the BIM model. And we have talked about focus on having flow efficiency instead of resource efficiency. For the BIM model as such, we want to have a process that gives us one, a steady and continuous value adding into the model. Two, cross-disciplinary, this is the fourth time, quality checked information from start to handover. How? We decided to look at design as a production line based on the philosophy from Lean Industry. A design group, as a design group, you will start with an empty shell and you will fill it from that point until it's complete. And as you may understand, the BIM model is our product. This is an example from Porsche. Did you know that all cars in Porsche are unique? All of them have a customer behind ordering a special product. This is the product, production line. It has a start and it has a handover. It also has some resources. And we have some input to the car. So, when talking about design being a process, you must ask, what processes do we have that will add value into our BIM model? You may define a process being a set of activities that interact to achieve a result. Or we can do it a little bit simpler In this figure, you see you have input on one side, you have activity in the middle, above you have some resources, below you have a procedure, and finally you have an output. So what does that mean? Well, we can say that the input is the egg and it's milk and it's salt and sugar. We could say uh, the resource is the gourmet chef why not? And the activity, that's something you would add in a special tact. And the procedure, that must be then the recipe, huh? So, then you're finished. So, what have we made? Hmm? A cake? Egg and milk? Milk? Hmm, good. And the chef, 
He's a well-known uh, Belgium uh, chef. His name is uh, Peter Grossen. That's a three star Michelin restaurant. He must be able to make something really good, I think. So we have the activity that has been adding. And here's the directions. Huh? You get what it is now? Uh, it's of course a Belgian waffle, huh? Yeah. So that's the way we work. Coming back to our bid model, actually the same procedure. You have a continuous input to your model. You have some activities you add. And you have a final output. We have resources. And the resources that, that are the highly competent design team. They can add activity into the model in order to get the final output. But then comes the question. How do we know the recipe? How do we define the directions? What to do when? You see, the BIM model, it starts with an empty shell. It's going to be finished. That's the final output. It's going to go through three waves. That's the building site, the procurement. Remember the picture where everybody was running? How do we avoid chaos in iterative processes, in creative processes? Remember, we have a highly qualified team. They are the best, for sure, but they also cost a lot of money. We are about to spend 20,000 man hours and one of the specialists. He's a Danish guy. He's an expert on explosions. He's only gonna spend 30 hours how do we know when to ask him to come? Not too early, not too late. This is, and now we have to, this is the hardest stuff, okay? It's gonna be easy afterwards. This is a PCP map. It's a strategical tool PCP means Project Creation Process Map. Here you have um, level one. That's the highest level of the map. It's familiar for us all. It's the phases in a project. You start with the early sketches and you finalize with handing over the building. Okay, so far so good. Then the next level, you see some gates? A typical gate is something you cannot, if, if you can't meet the gate, you can't proceed the project. So a typical gate in Norway would be building permit. Some other countries, they don't care about that. But in Norway, it's no use to continue with the project if you don't have the building permit. Then you have the different processes. In our project, we had uh, project management on the top level, which is the strategical management of the project. You have design, procurement, users' needs and users' equipment, and constructions. All these are processes. And each one of these processes has a key point they are placed in a logical order. And even more important, each one of these key points has an owner. An owner can be the architect, the engineer, the project manager. It can be the user, the client. So how to read this map? Well, we are first of all gonna talk only about the design so you can relax. The worst thing is over now, okay? And you see the line here? The key points are placed in a logical order. And at this point in the project, 
we are way into the design phase. And on the right hand side, there's written one specific thing that you cannot read actually, but it's written that the MEP engineer is to deliver his functional description. To the left side, there are two dots, and the dot says two things. The architect needs to finish his or her ceiling plan, and the user has to have the equipment layout finished. These are both needed for the engineer to put up. Oh my gosh, it's only 10 minutes left. Oh my gosh, so I have to talk faster. Okay. So, there we go. Actually, the design team used almost two weeks to create this, this map together. And the benefit is that during 14 days, we get to know each other. That's fine. But even more important, we get to understand the dependencies in the team as such. So, as a team, we are now, I have to jump a little bit, because I'm talking too slow. I normally don't do that, but that's okay. Let's see, I will jump till here. This is a simple way to illustrate matroness in a BIM model. To the left, you see a coarse mesh. And some of the items here are items you don't change. At this point in the project, actually the building site is almost about to start. The foundation works will start in six weeks. The structure will start in three months. And then you know that if the shafts, the staircase shafts are made out of concrete, you know that you have to understand the fire escape rules. So you see the green line to the right in the course model is the fire report. It needs to be finished at that time. And you don't change it afterwards. Because if you, if you change it, you will be wrong. So the BIM model moves from being a coarse mesh, like the skeleton in an elephant, and we move from there off into the more detailed phase of cross-disciplinary information, still without changing any of the parameters from the first wave. The last part is actually the part where the team only adds information that's not cross-disciplinary. This is a normal way I think most of us have experienced how a project develops. We have fairly long phases. You deliver perhaps 30% uh, of your deliverances in the concept phase. And the client has a huge chunk of information to evaluate. And very often the project continues and you get the feedback when you're halfway or one third into the next phase. What we have done in the KMD project is to chop off. We have been looking at the whole design from A to B as one continuous flow. Not having huge chunks to evaluate. And we have been chopping up with a 14 day interval. We call that a tuct. 
And even more important, the client needs to be there. So the client needs to evaluate on a 14-day basis. Not like we often experience that they come back three months afterwards or one month afterwards and you have to restart the whole design. You are never ever able in complex processes to actually cross-check everything at that level. So this is a very important principle of how we have worked in the KMD project. It's very central here is the highly valuable design team. There's a lot of experience, a lot of expertise in the design team as such. And to break down and to be able to, to control the information flow, this is where it happens. Everything I've been talking about till now is strategical. Now we are down to the design team. It's the MEP engineer, it's the fire engineer. They are the one, the architect, they are the one who knows the detailed information. And working in the tact, as we have been doing, it sits in that group to ask for the right type of information. And we have been using, I'm doing this fairly quick, I can come back and have a long lecture another time. We have been doing this through logs. Remember, um, I was talking about that we wanted to, or perhaps I didn't say it, but an uh, important thing is to avoid waste. Because we do cost quite a lot of money. And one of the things we have done is that we have not used one single minute on resumes. We have only been using logs. We have asked for information through a table, sitting around the table, pulling in information into the BIM model, and we have logged the questions. Having 14 days, a question should never be longer, never be more complicated than you can answer it in 14 days. You have to chop down the information flow. Sometimes we are allowed six weeks. Three, six weeks, yeah. So the questions are asked, and you receive it 14 days afterwards. Then it's green. And we do that around the table, so everybody sees if you deliver or not. And if you haven't delivered, you get the red spot. That's not so fun. Used very simple visual tools. This is a typical uh, agenda for a three-day meeting in our project. We start with uh, checking that everybody has delivered. We have table meetings where we go uh, through special issues. We have uh, one session of clash control. <coughs> and finally, at the end, we ask for deliverances from the whole group. And when it comes to clash controls, we are doing it, yes, but actually the quality doesn't sit in the clash control. The quality sits in you enabling to put the information in the model. And that's our experience, that very often you don't find any clashes because the information is not in the model. And, even more important, <coughs> clashes actually doesn't show what's drawn. So to be, make sure that you get what you need, you have to actually visually control the model. I have to jump this. So, I think I will end this lecture talking a little bit about values. Three core values. Transparency. Transparency means that everybody can observe and understand each other. Observing what others are doing 
and let others observe what you are doing will contribute to making each other better. For example, plans, overviews, and suggestions should be made big, visible, and easy to understand. We all have the same objective, and we are all working on the same project. So everybody needs to be able to see the same. Transparency means that the project progress is always visible. Also decisions, ideas, and information are not in someone's head, but accept, accessible to the entire team. So the BIM is our common virtual space. Being together in the same room is our physical space. And these two are just as important. They belong together. We have time for a small movie. You're not able to start it? No. Okay, then we skip it. This is a world map. And this is me, or you, wanting to sit in, a, in your own bathtub. And on many of our projects, we meet these guys that are very skeptical and not willing to share. And it gets even worse when they sit all over the world And the point I'm trying to make is that with the information flow we all are handling now, transparency and sharing will be more important than ever. BIM is just a way to collate information, but the structure of the information and the strategy behind, that's us. We want to sit in the same bathtub all of us, we want to share because that benefits the society and it benefits the project as such. This is a building, it's a picture from mounting the roof for the, one of the pebbles on King Abadullah's. It looks rather chaotic. We are back to the first picture with everybody running it's hard to say if there's a structure there. It did come up, but it could have come up in a smoother way. We need the road signs. We need the key points to structure our work. And our motivation has been a desire to optimize the input from every one of the specialists, being highly competent as a design team. In every project, and in the complex one as in special, we want to make sure that we get to deliver and to receive the right product at the right time. Based on the learnings from the KMD project, Snöata has now established their own method, tailored 
for iterative and creative processes. We have named the method Snowflow. Our platform is based on the understanding of that the strategy behind using BIM is more important than the tool itself. The core values are transparency, delegated ownership, and added value for all parts. In order to control your output, you have to structure your input. Snowflow is a mindset enabling us to run smoother and more structured processes. It all comes down to the human as a resource. How to optimize the interaction between individuals and how to weave each of the single efforts into one unified. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Astrid. It was, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry the beer is frozen the beer is, now. The yeah. beer is <laughs> nice and chilled. <laughs> now, I like this, uh, I especially appreciated this, this idea of putting the human back into the machine process. And this <clears throat> the snowplow project with the 14 day I found particularly um, intelligent and, and interesting to, mm -hmm. to think. And this idea that you, you never ask complex enough questions that you haven't got time to, to fulfill. I like that. Apart from the waffles and the elephant and the hot tub, which is also good, <laughs> uh, this is a part that I like. I would like to give a brief uh, few moments to the questions. I'm sure there are questions to Astrid. Please. Thank you very much for a very interesting report. But I'm uh, that uh, skeptic guy hiding behind curtain. Uh, and my question, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Asno Eta changing uh, the philosophy, Can or we? you just told the story about one of uh, Snoheta activities trying to to keep her in on the top of market. Um, can you ask that question once more? Yeah. Uh, did Snoeta change its philosophy? Or you just told the story about one of possible way where Snoeta trying to keep herself on the top of the market? We, we didn't change clear? philosophy, to put it that way. Um, our main objective, of course we want to deliver quality and then to, to optimize the input into our project. That's the main challenge, I think, for all of us, especially because the projects we design are so complex. So my personal belief is that the methods we are using today, they don't work to get up with the information flow we handle. We have to, to chop up the project as such and the information flow as such in order to gain the right quality. And for us, that's the main motivation. I think when you are um, a high cost and very focused on delivering quality, you have to be more efficient in your decision making. Um, and you have to find a structure that en enables everybody to onboard as the project goes on. So our core values are exactly the same. It's just that the methodology needs to become different. Was that an answer? Thank you. Merci pour votre présentation. Uh, Juste une question, ça demande une implication du maître d'ouvrage vraiment importante Donc, pour utiliser ce genre de méthode. Est-ce que le maître d'ouvrage répond toujours à votre demande de ce point de vue-là Parce que dans 
l'agile Scrum ou la, les présentations que vous faites donc sur la structuration donc de la méthode, ça demande une réactivité du maître d'ouvrage. Et donc c'était pour savoir si le maître d'ouvrage répondait toujours à votre demande pour la structuration de votre euh, travail. Unfortunately, it was not translated. <laughs> Any translate? Yeah. Yep. How difficult it is to the interaction with the client. Do you always find clients completely at ease with, with your process, or do you often find that you have to struggle to get the client to, to respond to the way you work? Yeah, of course, it, it's very demanding for the client actually to, to be a decision maker all the time. Very. Hmm. Actually, there's one term that, uh, that I'm struggling with, delegated ownership. Do you mean delegated ownership of the production process? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was sort of rushing the presentation at that uh, point. I would like to, to fill in. By delegated ownership, we mean that every specialist, and by specialist, I actually mean us as architects and all the engineers, they have to take ownership to their own processes. So that means that the project management of the project actually goes, we stay on the strategic level. We don't decide. So as a structural engineer, you are responsible for pulling in the information you need and to close it. And you can't actually blame anybody else for not having the right information. That's what I mean. I think now it's last to wrap up the proceedings. Wrap up the frozen beer. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, if you, uh, yes, sorry, again. Um, I will be very short with only four more slides, I think in the end, we did a SWOT analysis during the work in BIM Work Group, and we actually finalized that maybe one year ago in a, in, a, in a meeting. I presented some of that in another meeting. Then in the Budapest meeting this autumn, we brought it up again and discussed, and it wasn't, we didn't have the same agreement on everything, and that's good. It's, it's about the development. I have made just a summary of of, of, some of, of some of the issues in a SWOT analysis. And what we can, uh, those of you know what SWOT analysis is, it is uh, strength with BIM, it is uh, weaknesses with BIM, it's opportunity with BIM, and it's uh, and, um, and, and trouble facing BIM. And uh, some of the things that could be opp opportunities is also threats, and uh, it's very combined in that, but I think Listening to the lessons today, this might be a summary of, of many of the things. It's, it is quite equal to what we got in the, in the query from, um, uh, presented by Anetta and some of the discussions afterwards. We see that the threats in, in the um, uh, safety of information, the, the, the question about Autodesk and other levels is is a, is a hard thing, and uh, but we see also on the other hand the strengths of BIM is the better of the coordination that Astri mentioned. It is a coordination tool, very much. I don't go into the details on this. You will find it, and you can agree on it. And it's not black and white. It is colored and grayscaled, uh, and uh, varies a lot from country to country. What we can see when he hearing Peter speech, there are differences actually between Norway. Norway and Denmark are very equal in most things. But actually in the BIM issues, we are not that equal. That's quite strange. And that brings us to actually the recommendation. We see, we see that um, for the work in the, in the, in the BIM group, we, we, um, we see that many of the issues could not be solved actually at an overall European level. You have to do the work at local level. 
many things have to be solved at local level. We think that member organizations, you you if you don't have, you should establish national expert BIM group to prepare local issues and also to be in contact with the local building smart. We know they are very different from country to country. You have to be in contact with the standardization organizations, put people into positions there when the standardization process is going further. And we know that this standard that I've been presented will stop at a certain level. We know that this standardization will be not that detailed. It will be brought to a national level and that will be more serious. Then you have to be aware, you have to be prepared, you have to have the right contacts for that next process. And you have to prepare PDP, uh, CPD modules in, in BIM. The BIM work groups finishes its work it's in current form. That is our recommendation. We think we could have the BIM work group and all the experts as a virtual experts organization, as a task force. But that has to be decided by the new board. We think that the scope of services group, and we know that there are BIM experts in, the, in this uh, group, they could handle many of the issues. We will continue as a layer saw in SEN. And I think for the process further, we are just in a starting point, but as the work has been now, most of it has to be on local level and then on strategic level in, in the BIM and in, in, the, in, the, in the board and in the administration. So in the final, I want to thank all of the members of the group for all the great work done. I want to thank the administration, especially, in, in special Gerardo, doing a fantastic job assisting me, and Ian as well. You are fabulous. It's, uh, it has been a pleasure being in ACE for those years. And also thank to all my colleagues in the board. And uh, have a good, not frozen, beer. <laughs> Thank you, Lars. Thank you for your work. It was very appreciated. I think uh, this afternoon has been particularly interesting for me, for all of us, I hope. Um, we've seen, it started off quite worryingly for, for me. Um, the huge difference in, within the EU is, is obviously a big, a big point. I mean, there's such a big difference between North and South. We've had a very Nordic um, presence here today, and this is, and this is not by chance. Uh, in the, south, the southern um, states of Europe have a very different experience of BIM. So we have, we have people who aren't prepared to accept it, we have clients who aren't prepared to pay for it, we are worried about being able to afford it. Um, there is abuse of BIM in many ways, we have seen clients expecting things that are, should be unattainable. But I'm glad that the evening ended on, on a good note because in two different ways we have had two examples of how we can go forward. Uh, Adam um, Matthews said that, I mean, I, f I find BIM is inevitable. So he was saying it's a threat and opportunity. If you see it as a threat, you see it as an opportunity. Now, this thing has been told to me since 2008 when everything went bust. And they said the crisis has to be seen as an opportunity and not a threat. And I thought it was just one of those things to make you cheer up. But I have realized in these nine years that it is true. And I've seen many offices rejuvenated, reinvigorated, reinvented themselves and found ways to come out of the crisis and to do work. Um, and so I think if we accept the fact that we will not be rich as architects, or most of us, <laughs> or not, not by doing architecture anyway, um, then we, we can understand that there are ways of handling BIM. We have seen uh, Vincent's um, example, a small two-people office. We have seen Snoheta with 180 people, and they've shown us ways, intelligent ways, to make our work better and to make our work responsible and to make us more visible and to make us more credible. This is what we're all about. This is what we should always bear in mind, and this is what we have been shown how to do.
So let's find our way to do it. Thank you. The evening is finished. We have about eight minutes.